Substitution reactions replace one portion of a molecule with something else, while leaving the remainder of the structure intact. Nucleophilic acyl substitution turns one carboxylic acid derivative into another by substituting a leaving group attached to a carbonyl carbon, which is sp2 hybridized, with a nucleophile. Leaving groups attached to sp3 hybridized carbon atoms, usually halides, can also be substituted by nucleophiles, but the mechanism is necessarily different. There's no pi star CO to attack. The simplest sort of nucleophilic substitution at sp3 carbons involves the attack of a nucleophile directly on sigma star C leaving group. Since leaving groups, by definition, stabilize negative charge reasonably well, they're always more electronegative than carbon. So sigma star C leaving group is always larger on carbon. Therefore, the nucleophile attacks from the side of the molecule opposite the leaving group. As the nucleophile puts electrons into sigma star, the corresponding bond to the leaving group breaks simultaneously with the new bond being formed. During this concerted bond making and bond breaking, the other groups attached to the central carbon do a sort of umbrella flip, inverting the stereochemistry at that carbon. We call the halfway point of this reaction, which is a local maximum on a reaction coordinate diagram, the transition state. This reaction, called the SN2 reaction because it involves two molecules in its rate determining step, is sensitive to several factors. First, sterics. The nucleophile has to be able to get to the empty sigma star orbital. So sterically encumbered halides don't undergo this reaction well. In fact, leaving groups that are tertiary almost never undergo this sort of substitution, nor do really bulky nucleophiles. Second, nucleophilicity. The nucleophile must be high energy enough to force the leaving group out and umbrella flip all the substituents. So usually the SN2 reaction occurs with strong anionic nucleophiles. Finally, solvent. Any solvents that reduce the energy of the nucleophile, perhaps by strongly solvating it, hinder the reaction. Usually the SN2 reaction works best in polar aprotic solvents. Polar, so they can dissolve the ionic nucleophile and leaving group, but aprotic, so they can't hydrogen bond with the nucleophile. That would lower its energy significantly. In sum, SN2 reactions tend to happen when small anionic nucleophiles attack unhindered substrates with good leaving groups, especially in polar aprotic solvents. Another sort of substitution is also possible. If you recall your recent lessons from lab about IR spectroscopy, you'll remember that bonds vibrate. If a bond is relatively weak, as is the case for the bonds between carbon and good leaving groups, sometimes these vibrations are strong enough to just pop off the leaving group. This leaves behind a carbocation, a pretty unstable sort of species since it has an unfilled octet on carbon. If the carbocation is especially unstable, it can just bond back with the group that just left. But if the carbocation is stable enough to hang out for a brief moment, long enough for that leaving group to depart entirely, another nucleophile, really anything with a lone pair, can come satiate that carbocation. Because the carbocation is trigonal planar and its empty p orbital has two equal sized lobes, on either side of that plane, there's an equal chance that the nucleophile will attack from either side. The result is that SN1 reactions produce 50-50 mixtures of stereoisomers if the carbon where the reaction is taking place is a stereocenter. Since the rate determining step in this reaction, called the SN1 reaction, is the leaving group just leaving, 
It's referred to as unimolecular and primarily depends on the leaving groups, which need to be good, and the carbocation, which needs to be relatively stable. The more stable the carbocation, the more rapid the SN1 substitution. So what makes some carbocations more stable than others? Carbocations have sp2 hybridized carbon atoms with empty p orbitals. They are hungry for electrons and are stabilized by anything that can provide them. Typically, alkyl carbocations are stabilized by any adjacent sigma bonds that happen to align with the empty p orbital. This is called hyperconjugation. These nearby sigma bonds are usually pretty terrible donors, though, so it takes quite a few to make a carbo carbocation even remotely stable. This means that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are much more stable than primary or methyl carbocations, and therefore SN1 reactions are most likely to occur when a leaving group is tertiary and they never occur when the leaving group is primary. Solvents can also help to stabilize carbocations, and solvents that are polar and protic both stabilize the carbocation and solvate the leaving group, preventing it from rejoining its carbocation partner. To summarize, SN2 reactions proceed most readily with sterically unencumbered leaving groups and strong, small nucleophiles in polar, aprotic solvents, and they occur with inversion of configuration. SN1 reactions tend to occur when highly substituted carbocations can be formed, which occurs best in polar, protic solvents. And since the nucleophile doesn't take part in the rate-determining step of an SN1 reaction, its strength doesn't matter. SN1 reactions tend to occur with weak nucleophiles, and they occur with racemization, producing a mixture of stereoisomers.